uh, back in 1979, America lost about 60 of our brave Special Forces troops in a battle in the underground tunnel system of Dulce, New Mexico, against the aliens. And um, Don't know this a story. survivor, I believe his name was Phil Schneider. Are you familiar with that at all? No, not at all. It's okay, fascinating. It, Tell me about it. There, um, uh, there were some contractors doing some work with the government there, and believe it or not, these people had you know uh, various relationships with these uh, aliens, uh, some you know seven to you know ten feet tall. And there's about seven or eight different layers in these tunnel systems. I guess they were putting in, like, air handler systems, and I couldn't figure out why the aliens with their high technology couldn't do that themselves. But it was just kind of interesting, you know. Uh, they, they started having uh, uh, conversations with some of the people that there were in cages. And um, the aliens said, well, these people are being um, treated for psychosis and things like that. You know, it seems like uh, uh, President Eisenhower gave the aliens permission to abduct certain, um, you know, Americans for, you know, testing. And then they were supposed to, you know, uh, turn them loose in exchange for high-tech information. But... Uh, you know, studying scripture, and I know you're a man, and you know, the cloth and that. If you go into, um, uh, it would be like uh, Psalm 74. Uh, it says, uh, Have respect for the government, for the dark places of the earth are full of the habitations of cruelty. And the people that were in these cells were complaining that these aliens are doing bizarre experiments on them, just like, you know, what they do above ground when they have these uh, abductions, uh, hmm. uh, like Travis Walton, you know, fire in the sky and things like that. And um, uh, so they decided to uh, get the um, Green Beret involved, and the Green Beret were going to free these people in the underground uh, cells and that. And uh, so they had a firefight. Uh, killed by a number of the aliens, but um, the aliens had some sort of you know, high-tech weapons where took out about 60 of our troops. And, of course, the government covered um, the visits to the hospital as a prison riot, uh, how they were you know, bringing the dead uh, soldiers in there and that. I, I didn't well, know if you had anything. Uh, um, what's your source material for this? Basically just the Internet. Okay. Well, then, what, is there any primary source where is there any government documents about this? Is there any? You know, I, I get a lot uh, from your callers and okay. from the programs that's been on, you know, coast to coast throughout the years about it and that. Right. I've seen some, uh, uh, you know, videos by, you know, Phil Schneider and how he was explaining this. And he, I believe, died of a rather suspicious death. Like, unfortunately, a lot of people that bring up this uh, this type of information. Hmm. It sounds, by the way, I mean, uh, maybe that's where they got it. It sounds a lot like a scene in um, the movie Cowboys and Aliens. So I, I, I don't know whether they heard that and they incorporated that into the into the movie, but uh, there's a whole thing there about people held in cages underground in a series of tunnels and, and all of that. But all right, very, uh, Don, I don't know anything about it, so I'll keep an eye out. Maybe we've got a future show on that coming up on Coast to Coast. <laughs> In India, they got this guy that's 36 years old. I was watching the video on Google. And I Googled man who has uh, who gives birth to twin brother. So I watched this video of a guy named Sanji who actually thinks he has a tumor. And when they opened him up, uh, lo and behold, after they got through the liquid and everything else, they found this fetus in there. And it yeah. had little fingers. Yep. And it, yeah. Yeah. This is just and, like our topic last day, the vanishing twin syndrome thing. You know, um, your your screener said something about that. And yeah, I'm we had last that. week. Last week you did a whole show on this. Wow. I must I was have called, been asleep. Yeah, vanishing twin. Well, or it entered your brain unconsciously. Uh, the vanishing twin syndrome, um, and the woman's name was, uh, I can't remember, Dennis was her last name. Um <laughs> Carol Dennis with a Y, uh, okay. C A R Y L Dennis, and I think that's also the name of her website. But you can check me on that. Vanishing Twin Syndrome, and that's the study of people who believe their that their body, their souls have been affected by uh, having been a twin in the womb, and they can't put their finger on what is missing about their lives or why they always feel like. 
they're forgetting something or that somebody should be with them or they're always feeling this need to be around other people that they can't put their finger on. And then they find out later on that they were a twin, but that one of the twins died before it was born. And so these people were born as uh, as single twins or singletons. And as a result, uh, they just there's a hole in their life that they can't fill. And that's what we talked about last week. And a lot of the people discover that when something like that happens. When they go in for a surgery or something and they find out that, oh, my God, you've been lugging around the remnants of another twin in your body for years. I have PTSD. Uh, PTSD. No, I'm sorry, dude. And uh, From what? Behind that, pardon? From what? Um, I, uh, I, let's just say I came across an undesirable group of people in this country that should not be here. Okay. And ended up going to the authorities, and these people knew that I was the one that went, and after that I started getting death threats. I'm assuming we're not talking about mimes. We're talking about somebody that's like a really menacing group of people that shouldn't be here. Yeah, a very menacing group of people that should not be in this country. Yes, they're here to do harm in our society, and and uh, it's, yeah, anyway, they... Uh, they knew I was the one. I started getting death threats. Hmm. Um, I worked in the work, came into work one day, and one of them comes up to me and says, uh, "Goodbye, Fred." Oh, that's what weird. Do mean, what do you mean, goodbye, Fred? Oh, in case there's an accident, we never see you again. Uh, do you I, keep a gun creepy. underneath your pillow? Oh God! Um, I kept enduring this over and over and over. Finally, I um, something was said to me one night. I'm driving home. And I'm thinking, okay, what I don't I'm not gonna I don't know what I'm gonna find when I get home. Um, I didn't even want to go to my own house. So I, I pulled into a Perkins family restaurant. because hmm. uh, I knew that's where the highway patrolman ate. <laughs> yeah. I, I Good old Perkins. I walked, right, I walked right up to their table and I said, I need one of you guys to follow me home and they says, Where do you live? And I told them and the other one looked up and says, uh you're you're Fred so and so, aren't you? Oh, shut up! The cop knew too. Yes, I he oh, he's okay. We we just got the Bolton. We will uh, we'll follow you home. Go through your property. Walk around your house. Make sure you're okay, and we'll start to patrol your neighborhood. And uh, uh, oh man, yeah. Anyway, um, I I found a uh, a, a person that. Uh, deals with uh, trauma, and they do a lot of trauma uh, uh, training with uh, firefighters and policemen. Huh. And he also does, uh, I think it's called an EMDR, where it uh, it's a rapid eye movement. Huh. And he has helped me a lot. Um, I relocated to a different town. I had the military come look me up in that town and say, we know you're here. We know what you went through. Um, hmm. We're watching over you. That's uh, interesting. We do want you to go to a uh, to a, a certain academy and get professional training and get your conceal and carry permit. Hmm. Is that re- and, uh, does that bring you peace? It, it does. It, it does. It, it, has, it has brought me peace knowing that I have uh, something on my person that uh, – I hope I never, never, never have to use it, but uh, it has it has brought me some comfort. Yes, it okay. has. Appreciate that, all of that, Fred. I wish you weren't going through it, but appreciate you sharing it. Back in, I will say, the mid-70s, my mom and dad uh, lived down there in Texas, El Paso, right. and they had a small mom-and-pop mobile home trailer rental business. And um, one day, uh, two gentlemen showed up to rent a trailer. And um, they said that they were working uh, road construction. And um, they wanted to rent a mobile home. And so she had told them how much and everything. And they said that they were not going to get paid until Friday. Hmm. So she agreed to for a small deposit that they could she'd hold the trailer for him. So they gave her twenty five dollars and were supposed to be back on Friday. 
Well, these two men was Henry Lucas, the serial killer. Oh, yeah, sure. And um, Tool, is that his name? He, he he traveled with Lucas. He was oh, the one that, uh, he said that he had killed Adam Walsh, oh, John gosh. Walsh's son. Right. And he kind of bounced back and forth on that, said he did, said he didn't. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, no, I I know the kill. I I didn't know they traveled together. So you're kind of throwing yeah, something at me. No, I didn't they know. Did. They, they, Ot- Otis know that? Tool. The serial killers. Otis Tool. Yeah, yes, that's the guy. Yes, yeah. Yes, that's it. That's it. And so anyway, um, so they left that day, and um, well, Friday came and went, and they never showed up. Mm. So my mom room? went ahead and rented the trailer. Yeah. Well, the following Friday they came Uh-oh. and my little sister who was about 16 years old was out washing the car and they came and they they said they were there to rent the trailer and my mom uh, my sister told him she said well you know my mom and dad's not here right now but you know they'll be back later mm. and he said uh, he said well can we just go ahead and move in and she said, well, you know, I don't handle that kind of stuff. You need to talk to my mom and dad. Well, now right. she's getting a little perturbed. She was a little, a little feisty. Right. So anyway, I um, bet you felt different when you saw their picture on the front page of the newspaper. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> so I bet. Anyway, um, so they said, well, we want to go ahead and move in now. And she now she's getting irritated because the guy doesn't understand Right. And she told him, she said, look, she said, I told you, you know, my mom and dad will be back later. And so in his persistence, she said, well, look, which trailer is it? Well, he pointed out the trailer that they rented. And she said, well, no, there's somebody living in that trailer. Uh-oh. And so now he's he's really not too happy about this situation. Yeah. <laughs> and he says, OK, well, I want my money back. And she told him, she said, you know, I don't know what part of my parents are not here that you don't understand. Right. But do I need to call the police? Uh Uh-oh. So they got in the car and they left. Um, When their picture came out on the news. Yeah, really. On the front page, she about, you know, flipped it knowing that she had, you know, sassed a serial. (laughs) Right, right. My, my thoughts were there by the grace of God. Yeah, you know, really. Because we could have rented to them. And, you know, the truth of the matter was they probably never were working road crew. No. They were hiding out or something. But, you yeah, know, that they, did, they, even think, even for them to have not attacked your sister is something. And I, I got I to gotta get some other callers in before the top of the hour. But that is that's in the that's in keeping with a, a very interesting tradition, Linda, about um, people who have had close calls like that, where they only realized afterward um, what maybe one more word or one you know five ten minutes later had the mood shifted that something terrible could have happened. So wow, thank you, appreciate that. Johnny is in Phoenix on Coast to Coast AM. John? Hi there, uh, Mr. Punnett. I'd like to talk about the end of the world. Now, there's been a pastor named Harold Camping who's saying that Jesus will come in 2011 and it will be the end of the world. Now, how do you feel about that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I've been hearing a lot about that. Yeah, I don't believe it. I every Any pastor who's ever said that ever in the history of mankind has been wrong. So I'm going to I'm going to bet on he's the next in the long line of wrong pastors. What do you think? Well, I think Mr. Camping is correct and he's been preaching this message for 50 years on Family Radio and he's been reading the Bible line by line comparing scripture with scripture and he believes that there is an encoded message in the Bible in that when it says that I will seal up these books until the end of time, he believes that now that those books are being revealed, and he has written several books on that yeah, fact. No doubt about it. So what happens if he's wrong? Well, there is not a case of his him being wrong. In his I understand mind. that. I, that's not my question. What happens if he's wrong? Where will, What will happen to your belief system on the dawning of 2012? 
Well, I just believe that he is correct, and there is no way out of it, because the Bible, it says that. I understand what you're saying. I heard what you said. So what you're saying is you don't have a plan B. I would just recommend to you, based on the history of failed predictions on the end of the world, that just in case there's a 2012, have a plan B. Fair enough? Well, uh, if the Bible says this is the way it is, and that's the Word of God, then, uh, then there's no way out of that. That's his interpretation. I understand that. Many very famous pastors and theologians before him have made similar claims, been equally wrong. You ask my opinion, that's my opinion. Have a plan B. Have a plan B for 2012, just in case you have to go through it. I wouldn't have all your eggs in the basket that you won't have anything to worry about after 2011. Just to, It's a wild shot. But And then call me back and see how it's working out. Talking about our rights being taken away. Exactly. And you, and you asked, what rights do you not have that have been taken away from you? What can't you do that you used to be able to do? Well, that, the question was more specifically, what do you want to do tomorrow that you can't do? And right. I, and, and and that, I waited and, for the answer all night. Right. I waited for them to give you the right answer all night, and they never did. Right. Okay, and, what do you and, have? Okay. According to the Patriot Act, okay, any individual or individuals that try to change government policy either by violence, intimidation, or intellectually – are considered domestic terrorists. Okay, okay. I'm going to ask Joe. I'm going to ask that's you this why, question. That's why Joe, Cindy I got to get. I'm going to get over. out of the theory. I'm going to get out of the theory here because this is what the other people are doing. They're talking in theory. What can you, Joe, not do tomorrow that you want to do? I can't talk against the government. You're doing it right now. Well, who's but, stopping you? But like I said, and I've been I doing it all night long. Who's stopping me? But that's the whole point. If no, it's not the point. Together, I can't get people together and go out and then walk in front and picket in front of the White House without being arrested for being yes, a domestic terrorist. Yes, you can. Terrorist. Yes, you can, and they do it all the time. Well, now, I'm not, the I'm, Patriot Act, you can't. Okay, but here's what I'm saying, Joe. There's a point where we freak ourselves out. We look at papers. We read Internet stuff. We get all torqued up. And we think well, that's a law. That's not you know that's not internet. Well, that's a law. But Joe, it's a little second. It, it has a very specific application. I'm not saying it's not wrong. It sounds wrong to me to say you're going to elect you know arrest people intellectually. I, I exactly. That sounds terribly wrong. But I go back to again, and this is the this is where the rubber hits the road, and this is why I separate myself out from the total doomsayers who say w- the world isn't worth living in tomorrow. As oh, I, I say to you. That. But a lot of people do, and they and they look back and they go, our best years are behind us. As, as the caller said that night, you heard him say, going to hell in a handbasket, you can't do <laughs> anything anymore. Nonsense. You can do anything. Why we're losing. Okay. What you can do tomorrow, you can grab a picket sign and you can walk up and down in front of the White House. And when you do and you get arrested, then you let me know. If you're walking up and down with a picket sign in front of the White House, you're okay. Because people See, are doing why it. Cindy Sheehan went overseas. Why? Because I think she was threatened with this domestic terrorism. She was sitting in front of his house for two months. Really? I think she got bored. I think maybe America <laughs> got bored with her. <laughs> you know, I want to know the truth. I think she may have kind of overstayed her 15 minutes for a while, and she went somewhere else. Remember when she said she was going to quit? She was tired of it. She was going back home. Well, that didn't last yeah. long. And so, no, it sure did I don't know. I, I don't think it's because anybody rousted her, but may, maybe they did. I Maybe I'll get her on the air and I'll find out how it's but been I, lived I, out I for wanted her. to put that law, because it's actually an actual law, I wanted to put that across to you so you, you understood, that. you know, that, 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 that that's an actual law that was passed. I get that. And, I, and there's a million of them out there. Theoretically, tomorrow, I can't eat an ice cream cone upside down on a jungle gym <laughs> in half the states in the United States. I mean, there's all sorts of laws out there. But I you're come awesome, right down dude. to it again. What's that? I said you're awesome, dude. Oh. Okay, but I say that's tomorrow. You do something that you say you don't think you can do and email me back and let me know how it goes. Okay, fair enough? Roger that. Hey, what's going to see if you guys knew anything about, uh, like, mysterious abandoned staircases found out in the woods? Heard several different stories about this. Maybe you guys even covered it. I haven't covered it before. Have you seen them? No, I have not, but I've heard... Uh, all sorts of just crazy stories. A lot of uh, search and rescue people 
telling stories about, you know, their, you know, seniors, the telling them to kind of stay away from them. They just like abandoned staircases out in the middle of the woods that apparently you're supposed to steer clear of. Are, are they like staircases, like four or five stairs, like going up to a small plane or something like that? Or are they like a still like a really formal, like, you know, stairway to heaven kind of thing? Uh, kind of a little bit of both. They go nowhere. They're really just staircases. I've seen a few pictures online. They vary from being wooden, you know, pretty good condition to old stone ones. But really, yeah, you just. Well, oh, some of those, like, all right, so like you say a stone one, here's my first thought. I don't know if this is true, but I have seen the remnants of uh, a cabin that had burned down many, many years ago, and there were stone or brick steps that went up to the front door. There was nothing left of the cabin. You couldn't see anything about the foundation. You couldn't see the. you know, all of that had just, you know, there was no basement. So it was like a slab house or something, and um, or nothing at all. It was just on a like a dirt foundation, and that's possible that they could have. You know, they caught fire. Trees have grown back since then, and the only thing they just left the staircase there. All right, that's. I mean, it's a thought. I don't know, but I. I mean, I. I'd like to keep looking into it, but I. I definitely will. I'll. I'll, yeah, I'll take a poke yeah, around. That. Some of the things I've read say is you know different things from like missing time. Yeah. Uh, like hauntings almost, kind of similar stuff like that. I'm game for all of that. I will, I'll look into it. I'll see if I can find somebody who spent some time studying it. Go ahead, Annie. Having me in, there's two things that, that need to be outlawed or were outlawed. One is that in 1996, the Telecommunications Act of 1996 already outlawed touchscreens on phones because they discriminate against the blind and the handicap, and I don't know why they let them sell it. And uh, the way to test your phone is to be bound and gagged and blindfolded in the trunk of a car and trying to make a call. And there's well, no you Siri you then. You have to click onto an icon that you have to see to use the phone. Well, I would just use Siri. I would say, Siri, call my, call my mother. Tell her I'm in a trunk. What's that? It just doesn't work for everybody. Here's a question. Does everything that we make have to work for everybody that lives? As many as possible. It has to be in compliance with the Telecommunications Act of 1999, and the touch screens are not. You shouldn't have to click and click and see icons to make a phone call. Well, I don't know enough about that act or what was subsequently addressed in that act or whether there were revisions to that act or whatever. So, but I, I am curious because like you have a long list of things that should be outlawed. This was right? already outlawed in the next. No, 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 no. But when you bring it up, when, when you bring it up, you, you bring up other things that you think should be outlawed. Yeah. And so. There's one other do you, thing. Yeah. Okay. Do you have another thing we should outlaw? Well, the national federation of the blind is pushing this thing because these people are in violation. However, it should be outlawed to rake leaves and especially burn them because People are robbing the soil of nutrients that are vital to the ecosystem, and they should be allowed to compost in place. Yeah, I don't want to do that. Well, the soil will be much richer. And I don't want to do that. There will be better for you. I don't want to do it. So why should a law make me do it? If we live in a free society, why should I be forced to do that? Well... Ask Dr. Joe Wallach. I'm asking you, why do I, why should we be making laws all the time that force people to do things because or harms prevent, others. Because it nobody, harms others. nobody's harmed by me not composting and whoever I don't want to compost. Whoever grows vegetables. I don't want to. I don't want to. Somebody will one day. Somebody I don't, will try to eat something one day that grows there and it'll be devoid of nutrients. Well, that's, that's, that, I understand that's how you look at it, but I, that's not, I don't, I think it's easy to write laws and tell everybody's got to do this and to use the legal system or use legislature to always be making people do stuff. But that to me runs contrary to a free society. You want to convince me that it's good. Okay. And you want to persuade me 
that I should or shouldn't be doing that, that's all right. I happen to live next to a, a forest and I get all of the leaves on my property. There are times when I open my front door and it's like a snow drift of leaves. And so, no, I will be raking. And and if I don't rake, they just pile up uh, uh, six inches deep and it cuts off my lawn. And I like a little bit of lawn and so does my dog. And so I want to to be able to live life the way I want. And I don't want somebody telling me what I can and can't do with the leaves that, that pile up on my property. So I don't think that's a, I don't like the way we should be always be thinking about things we need to outlaw and force other people to do. But I do like, I do think there should be options for blind people. And I hope that that's perhaps one of the revisions that you don't know about is that there are availabilities for touch screens and that it isn't just everybody's in violation of this 1996 law, but you know, that blind people have options and they should. And, and, and every person who's handicapped should have options. Um, but I happen to like my touch screen and I like Siri and I want to keep that too. So I'll be, I'll be doing my touch screen while I'm raking and I'll be thinking of you. Hey, I just wanted to let you know, um, I have seen Elvis. He is alive and well. I saw him in Jefferson City, Missouri. Um, I was actually doing some Elvis jokes down there one night with my band. And uh, the next time we played there, <laughs> there was he came by and looked at me right in, square in the eye. And it was amazing. I thought I saw I, I had to look again. It was like looking at the face of God. Okay, but he would have been pretty old by now, wouldn't yeah, he? Yeah, but you know what? He was slim. He looked good. He was like, hey, man, I ain't fat. And he rubbed his, put his hand over his stomach, and he was a very handsome man. He had some gray hair, but um, he... Was he... And you sure it wasn't an Elvis impersonator? I had to look and look again, and there's no one in the world with eyes like that. And if you think about all the information, like, you know, his his grave was misspelled. He's He was a perfectionist, and his dad threw a fit when they misspelled his name on his birth certificate. Yeah, we talked about that. Talked um, about that a little bit. It's, it's okay. amazing. I mean, some people, they just fake their deaths. They, okay. Some people have to. Um, but well, I appreciate that, Ted. I, I thank you, and I appreciate you passing along your firsthand account. And uh, Well, well, uh, Ted, if, uh, if you ever get the opportunity to find any evidence that that's legitimate, because we get a lot of, sure. I'm sure you need to understand, we get a lot of people that say that, and then, you know, how do we know? It's just a person saying something, and, and we can't just, you know, report on anything we get unless there's at least some, some foundation in it. And, you know, we, um, we, we offered our $3 million reward for proof that Elvis is alive, and we got 5 million people came to our website, ElvisWanted.com. And, and anybody uh, uh, anybody get close to getting the money? We got some amazing stuff. We got some stuff that we didn't know about, and a lot of people pointed us in directions we didn't know about, and it's been tremendously helpful. Okay. And uh, one of the things we got is there's a guy in Venezuela actually had a former uh, guy that he knew down there. It doesn't is not in touch with him anymore, but had some handwritten letters from this gentleman, and says I swear this is Elvis, and, and he had handwriting analysts do analysis on it. And it it came up true, but you know again, I mean, you know, hmm. I I still I still question everything. I take everything with a grain of salt and sure. and whatever, but if but certainly it'd be great if your if your listeners if they found anything of any of any substance to go to our website elviswanted.com and keep those uh, cell phone cameras handy. Uh, I look at on demand generation of hydrogen through using water in your automobile. Right, that's that's what I was talking about it with him, and I think that's the that's the system that I've heard that sounds most feasible. Just being able to fill up your your sort of you spill, for lack of a better word, your gas tank with water and be able to process it as you drive. Exactly, but that's not that's not accepted by uh, standard mainstream science at all now. But it's been it was it was demonstrated very wide. I mean, this one scientist, uh, Stanley Myers from Grove City, Ohio, demonstrated it over and over again, and he ended up dead for his problem. And there was a another another inventor in Australia who also built a car and demonstrated it to uh, automotive uh, sanctioning bodies and showed it working. His name was Steve Horsath from uh, Australia, and he uh, 
he did a different approach than uh, Stanley Myers, but uh, but just beyond hydrogen in automobiles, uh, people, uh, individuals, rather than going out and buying a hybrid, there's a couple things they could look at. There was a guy from Texas, Thomas Ogle. He got 100 miles to the gallon in a 71 Ford LTD with a 351 engine. And if his his patent is available, and it although it ain't a, a weekend job, it's not that difficult to reproduce it. Well, that's yeah. it, it's definitely worth looking at for a topic for the future, and I think we need to get an expert in here. And it's been a while since we've done one on alternative energy, so thanks for the suggestion, Charles. <laughs> I have an interesting story that hadn't, hadn't been told for a long time. My grandmother dated and, uh, a man named Wink Cogswell, and Wilbur Wright used to ride a, him around on his bicycle, and mm. his his mother did the original seamstress on the on the plane, the original plane. Huh. His dad was Dr. Cogswell, and he was their doctor, and one day he just up and disappeared and was never heard from again. And, uh, I, and, and it affected his son, Wink, who, who, who we took care of him in his later days and buried him in Kitty Hawk. And uh, huh. it's one of those stories that it's, it's, it's been a long time ago. What year would that have been that uh, that the that old man Coswell disappeared? Well, it, it was a, it was a few few days after the original flight. Huh. And uh, but uh, you know it just uh, Wink talked about that a lot, you know, and, and what a history that is, you know, to, to have his mom do the, the scene right. on the plane. You know, there's a, a, I guess there probably was a time, yeah, that is kind of cool, um, that she was the seamstress on Kitty Hawk, that the, that there was a, there was a time when, um, when probably, obviously, when disappearing was a lot easier. I mean, you could, you could up and disappear into, you could just decide I'm going to go pan for gold in Alaska. <laughs> and you could, you know, with, Two hundred bucks in your pocket, you could you could get on a train and you could go into the, out in the middle of nowhere, change your name, and nobody would ever know whatever happened to you. I think it's must it's getting increasingly harder, even for somebody like you just described, to just disappear. You couldn't if you were a doctor and you were it's it's got to be a lot harder, or at least I would think. But that's somebody who sounds like they were intentionally trying to disappear, but maybe not. Maybe that's a whole other thread tonight for Open Lines, and, and thank you for that. Yes, uh, back in 1973, my uncle was a lawyer in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I actually lived back in Minnesota then, and uh, um, he just went down to the store. He had gone to visit his daughter in Milwaukee. He was from a smaller town, and uh, uh, he just went to the store and never came back, and the FBI investigated and looked through his car and whatever and didn't find anything missing and no clue. And he he was uh, not a criminal lawyer. He was, uh, um, uh, it was just a real big tragedy for the family, and uh, I think it still bothers the uh, uh, six children that he had to this day, you know, yeah. the abandonment or issues or just the fact that, you know, the unknowing, and I, I doubt there was any aliens, but you never know. Right, right, right. Was, no, no, I get that. So what about, so what was the operating theory? Any, what did they come up with an explanation when, you know, sadly, when they held a memorial service or something, what did they say? Well, they didn't. Uh, they didn't really have a memorial service. Uh, it was all uh, so questionable, and the FBI came back to my aunt and said, well, you know, he must have run off with another woman or something. Some back then, you know, whatever simple explanation they could come right. up with. But, right. you know, no official explanation. It was in the newspapers. He was a prominent lawyer. Kenneth placed it. Uh, mm. And uh, not, like I said, not a not a uh, uh, criminal lawyer. But his uh, but my father always said that it had something to do with possibly the mafia or something. I I didn't know back then that there was some mafia involvement in Milwaukee. But uh, well, there's mob everywhere. I mean, so the I mean somebody had that territory. You know, it's kind of like um, uh, yeah. it's, it's kind of like uh, like the Sealy mattress people or something. Even if there's not a Sealy store there, somebody has that territory listed in their exactly. sales you know list. Well. Um, it's kind of like this story. Have you been following the story out of uh, Beverly Hills about this uh, um, this publicist for the movie yeah. Burlesque? 
And it, yeah. it, it's sort of that's super mysterious where it's sounding a little bit like a, some sort of hit. I mean, that they somebody yeah. pulled up and five closely grouped shots in her chest at the stoplight. Yeah. And I mean, it, it just it just goes to show you, you, you may who knows what somebody may be the victim of, even if they're a victim of mistaken identity. You know, he could have been taken out because somebody thought he was another kind of lawyer or they could have thought he may have he may have been approached to be a lawyer for somebody in the mob. And he said no. Yeah. Yeah. There could have been anything. But, you know, it's it's just years and years. What is that? 40, 47 right. years ago or whatever. You know, we you know, it still affects the family. And I bet the it does. The lingering thoughts that he may have not been a legitimate guy, these kind of things. Right. And, you know, of course, he was my my mother's brother, so of course we all had great respect for him and and didn't believe that he had run off with another woman, like the FBI said. You know, or like or like my grandfather did, which is you know, it just goes to show you there too. And thanks is that you never know. A couple months ago, uh, Art or uh, uh, George was doing a lines there and, and i don't know if you you heard this one guy call in or not but he he was talking about he worked in the army and he had a videotape of uh hugh hefner and uh eisenhower I believe, uh, and he said that they were inside this big warehouse and it was uh it had a bunch of uh, alien bodies in there and uh, uh they were all it was like an old real film, supposedly, and uh, I, I was just wondering if you at all had ever followed no. up on that or not. No, well, it, you know that's the problem since we don't uh, we don't trace your calls as much as we might like to. Sometimes we really depend on whether that you know that person's going to follow through and and send us that uh, that film. I haven't heard anything about it since then, so I can only imagine either the person. Uh, if they have what they have, they decided that it was something they would try to monetize, so they may be shopping it, and we haven't heard about it because we don't buy stuff, uh, and or that they don't have what they have, and they just were you know going off of a fantasy or something, and it just felt like talking. If they've got what they've got, we're still open, and obviously, Aaron, you're a testament to the fact that they're still interested in it. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it's it just. It, it sounded really neat, and you know that, that sounded like some pretty solid proof. You know that uh, if he really did have this this, this old nineteen thirties yeah. or forties reel, you know what I mean? It, it, it just sounded kind of neat. And I, it I, would I be the that guy it, back. it would be the story of the century. It would be the story of this and any other century. Honestly, if oh. they, if if he had it, I mean, it would be. It's a cool enough of a story of Eisenhower and Hugh Hefner. Well, hanging yeah. together, which I didn't know they did a lot of. So, I mean, if, if they if he's got film of uh, I, you know, Dwight Eisenhower and Hugh Hefner watching women play badminton in the grotto, that would be a story. Didn't even have to have aliens in the background, but heck, that that would be interesting. We'll do a couple of emails and then get to Howard Bloom. Pun it, you're an idiot. Writes Sully. Anybody can tell just by looking at the photos of the hanging that it's a different Saddam. This goes back to a conversation we were having last night on Coast to Coast AM. A caller had claimed that it was as plain as the nose on my face that uh, this was a different Saddam. This was a body double that had been hanged for various reasons, including the CIA being involved in Saddam Hussein's life. First of all, writes Sully, this Saddam Hussein's thinner and older than the Saddam Hussein we've seen in the other pictures. It could be because he's been in prison for a couple of years. Anyway, secondly, I've had an expertise in this area because of my years in photography. If you look at any of the earlier photos of Saddam, you can see that Saddam in those photos had no gray hair and he never wore a beard. The Saddam they hanged is clearly a body double because he's always been pictured with a beard. It's like a signal that it's not the real Saddam. Or it's like a signal that he stopped shaving. We just don't know yet. Your callers were right. The CIA saved Saddam once more and let him get away to Syria and hung some older guy. You, sir, are a buffoon. Signed, Sully. Uh, Sully, if I can say, I've 
I have never I have never played a you know a reed instrument ever. So no. Um, where do the wackus come from who think this was a double? Writes Rob. Even if you believe that Saddam was a CIA agent, they eat their own. He would be executed and not taken out of the country just to cover, you know, their CYA at the CIA. If I was the double, I would be screaming, I am not Saddam. Why would he go quietly if he was the body double being hanged? Thanks, Rob. I enjoy listening to Art. And I was ready to turn the dial because you had on all these yahoos talking about a fake Saddam being executed or whatever crud was on your show. And it was really boring when you finally got your guest on last night. Anyway, your interviewing style leaves much to be desired. You should try listening to art for a while to see how it's done. Warmest regards, Dr. Rudy. You know, I, 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 I must be the slowest student in the, on the planet. I've been listening to art for 10 years. I still haven't figured out how to do it. Uh, I've been on the show for going to be eight coming up. Uh, one of these days I'll catch on. Uh, but I always love it when people who are doctors feel the need to mention that they're doctors. You know, it's like it's like they consider their opinion like an opinion plus because they put a doctor in front of their name. Like it's not just in it. It's not, this is not just an opinion. I'm a doctor. So there's really no arguing with that. You know, like Dr. Mengele, you know, or <laughs> Dr. Jekyll, that kind of thing. 